Now, before I actually go on to the proof, right, uh, I'd like to answer a question, or oh, actually to, to, hi, uh, to, uh, what's to uh, follow an advice that was given to me this afternoon before lunch, which was actually, there was questions asked about what happens to finite size systems, right? So let me, let me put in something, a theorem about finite size systems. So still the same operator, right? So I'm looking at, uh, well, my Anderson Hamiltonian minus Laplace and plus V omega IID, right? And now I'm going to look at a theorem that may say C. Uh, well, same assumptions. <coughs> well, some conclusions. It starts the same way. You should already know that. Uh, what did I want to say? Uh, for, uh, positive. Such that with probability, so here there's a change. This one left, uh, such that for any p positive, with probability 1 minus L to the minus p, so L is going to be large, so it's going to be very probable. Uh, we consider now H omega restricted to some cube, right? I restrict my Hamiltonian. To a cube, you can do any kind of restriction, take if you want, directly boundary conditions, Neumann boundary conditions, you can just project on both sides. Of course, this is a finite dimensional matrix. It only has eigenvalues, right? It's a finite dimensional matrix, not much can happen, right? So what we can say, we can say that the eigenvalues are simple, right? That's not difficult. And the second thing we can say is that for any E belonging to the spectrum of this matrix, right, phi of E take a normalized eigenfunction. Uh, phi of E is normalized eigenfunction, then uh, there exists some localization center in minus L, L to the D, such that for any X in the cube, if I look at phi E of X, this is bounded above, from above, by, uh, what should I take, something like uh, 1 plus L, L, sorry, L to the power uh, D plus P plus 1 over 2, if I'm not mistaken, E to the minus mu X minus X. Right? So, what do we have here? The picture is the following then. We have this big cube over which we restrict the operator, right? And we know that the eigenfunctions are localized oops, around localization centers. And what does it mean localized? It just means that here you have something which is of size constant times log L, right, where the constant depends on P and is large enough. Which means that, you see, again, this estimate as before is useless if this side is larger than one, okay? So this ball is just where the thing is larger than one, this is the only precision up to which you know the eigenfunction, right? What's happening in there, you don't know. Anything can happen. And so <coughs> this gives you, coming back to uh, Thierry's talk uh, before, this gives you an idea of how large the system size. If you take a localized system satisfying this, if you now take a s this system at the small scale of size log L, 
you may well be here. And so there will be eigenfunctions where they won't look localized anymore, right? Because here they will be living their life in a way independently. Okay? <coughs> so this prefactor actually is quite important. Of course, it's not optimal, but it's quite important. Right? Because so when, when, we, when you speak of localization length, people tend to concentrate on this number. But that's not the main thing. There is one thing that is to be said. There is, I don't think there is any mathematical result concerning this. But actually, this factor needs to be there. Meaning if you remove it, the theorem is false. Right? There can construct counterexamples. Okay? But what happens is that the eigenfunctions for which this is required, and this is a very natural thing to, uh, a question to study, should not be very numerous. You see, how many eigenvalues do you have? Well, the number of eigenvalues is going to be 2L to the D. Right? And roughly, among these eigenvalues, most of them will follow the way we'll follow the description given by physicists, meaning that this thing is going to be of order one, this constant. But for a few of them, actually, well, so for one plus little o of one times 2L to the D, you should be able, as I said, I don't, <coughs> you should be able to replace, should be replaced by one. Right? That is, you really, have, you really have an exponential decay, and things are localized around a single point. But there are a number of eigenfunctions, okay, which is much smaller for the L to the 2D, where you need some prefactor. Okay? And actually, the number, so roughly, conjecture, uh, if you count the number of energies, E, for which the L-infinity norm, so we take the soup sorry, phi E of x, x less than L, is going to be larger than some constant, right? So roughly this prefactor is the inverse of the L-infinity norm. Right? It's the inverse of the soup norm, up to some small modifications. So if you count the number, this should satisfy something like, so of course you divide this by the volume. Uh, let me call it k. e to the minus some constant, I don't know what to call it, eta times k. Meaning the number of eigenfunctions, right, which are really concerned by this constant, should be exponentially small in the size of this constant. And of course, when this gets less than a certain number, right, this is going to be less than one, there is, there is none left, right? They don't have enough of these functions. So this is not proved, right? That's a conjecture, it's, but it's, it's actually, I think it's, yes? Yes. They, they cannot have a large supremum value. They cannot have, here the this is, that, the uh, sorry, uh, they, they have, a, sorry, this is not this, it's the other way around. I want to, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in small, uh, let me think now. I want to know that they are flat, so they have a small supremum value, right? I want those to have a small supremum value, and this one should be, uh, what is the rule of thumb now? Um, yeah, you're, you're right, and this should be, uh, it, it should be exponential, but uh, yeah, I want them to be flat, right? The ones, the ones I think of that have, I mean, they live locally, but over some large portion of space, okay? So I want to them to have a small supremum value, okay? And uh, is, let me think now, is it exponential? Um, yeah, it should be exponential in the size of the supremum value, right? So yes, sure.
the value of mu, the value of the local derivation function. Because basically the question that the prof was asking, or the question that I was asking in this context is, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the power potential between, let's say, zero and one completes the question, and the user likes to see in three. And then what happens is that as you grow your eigenvalue, of course, the support naturally grows. And at some point, you are sort of exhausting the size um, for a large eigenvalue just because you are on a finite system, so that's what happens. So the yes. So, but, but I don't understand what you mean with large eigenvalues. Here the eigenvalues, uh, well, they are all order one, right? The, the operator is going to be bounded by some constants, so the eigenvalues, are, they are not going to infinity. This is... This no, oh, you're, you're right. I'm taking... F yeah, okay, but once you fix the disorder, once you fix... Yes. Yes. But the question is, you know, so at some, at that age, you are coming to the moment when they are sort of looking down to life in the finite dimension. So you need to know localization lines or have some idea of localization lines which indicates localization for you or the fact that you have just escaped the size of your domain. So um. Okay, I see. I see your point. I see your point. Okay, I agree with you. I agree with you that the fact that you have, for if you do numerics, right, and you are limited by the size of the system because you are numeric, uh, limited by the computational capabilities of your mm -hmm. machines, then you need to know what mu is. Exactly. Okay. Trying to bridge that idea, and I am Sorry. Sorry? Well, yeah, it's true, but uh, as Thierry underlined, right, I mean, the finite system is still 20 to the 23 particles, right, so you have some space to play with, right? I mean, uh, when the length scale is nanometer, right, and uh, you have a one centimeter sample, it is pretty large, well, right? I mean, the sample... Well, 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 not always. I don't, I don't fully agree, because if you take, yes. for instance, it's typically in our experiment, mm -hmm. there is a moment when we have a transition from a localization length of, let's say, uh, one millimeter mm -hmm. localization length, which would be one meter. Mm -hmm. And one meter is bigger than the experiment. Than the experiment, this I, I believe. But uh, what, is, what is actually, uh, what's the parameter that you're wiggling to uh, get this transition? Well, for instance, in the case of Specker, where uh -huh. we have an effective mobility head, which is the first order, then beyond that one, the localization length suddenly increases. It's still localized because it's one bit, but the localization length suddenly increases by three or four or five order of magnitude. Okay. So it's an effective mobility. Oh, sure. This, uh, of course. This I understand. This I understand. But I don't have an answer for a... Uh, um, no, there is. There, you can get some dependence. Actually, in the, in the proof of the theorem, I'm going to get a value for this number. Right? I'm going to get a value for this number uh, in terms of, and uh, um, in term, actually a value of lambda, for lambda zero as well. Okay? So. No, sure. I, no, I don't have an optimal value, uh, so sure. As I don't know how to get the regime below lambda zero, I've, I'm going to have a hard time to get an optimal value, right? I have no control of what's happening below, so. Well, there was actually an intuition in the initial paper by Anderson, right? And it was related, as far as I remember, 
to uh, counting the number of self-avoiding random walks on the lattice, right? So... Yeah, this is a correct intuition, actually. This can be proved. This, this can be proved that actually the number of... Uh, well, actually, it's uh, on, the, on the box of size L, the number grows exponentially with L, right? And there is a constant in front of the exponent of L and of the volume. And uh, this constant is actually one of the things that's coming in to play for computing the lambda zero. No, in this case, it's not dependent on energy because you are dealing, you, you, the one you're looking here, looking at here, is the one that's valid for all energies. So you are not, you are not, doing, you are not doing anything local, right? So in one dimension, one knows what it is, but in higher dimension, um, I don't think so, actually. And it, one may be able to do something at the spectral edges, right, which is some, somewhat... Uh, even this, yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm not sure that people actually tried to crank out numbers of the proofs that they made, right, to, to understand how far it is. What one has is, in the case of weak randomness, if you let lambda be small, there are some effective computations. There are some effective computations of how large in the coupling constant the thing should be, right? But uh, in terms of uh, a system uh, with a finite size, so order one constant, I'm not sure anybody tried to compute this. And I'm not sure it's going to be very meaningful, actually, because uh, you have many constants in, in a physical system, right? There are many constants that we have omitted here. Right? I mean, none of the, the, the ones that I have in front of Laplacian, the fact that Laplacian has really a symbol cosine to... Yeah, in, in, yeah, okay, I'll, uh, uh, <coughs> in this case, I mean, in the case of, in the large disorder. Mm. No, no, sure. I mean, it, it feels to me as if that still might, it might exceed the... Well, um, yes? So, so, so again, that, that I think that depends on the system you're, you're looking at. And, and the question, question you're asking, yeah. The question I had, whether indeed it's, a, it's a, a set of, which is still proportional to the size of the system, or whether it could be subdominant. It could be subdominant. It depends on how large you want the constant to be, right? If you want the constant to be really of this order, I think it's going to be subdominant. But if, you, if it's a smaller power, it's going to be... Well, it's gonna, if it's a power, if the constant depends on the system size, it's going to be subdominant, I think, but right? But uh, you have to, uh, so it's not because you have space, that the space will be filled by a particle. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if sure. If you have fermions, if you have bosons, sure. it's going to uh, occupy a very but different room of space. Uh -huh. So it, you might never see that. Yeah. No, that's correct. Right, so that's so I agree with. It might be that there are these better results with the well-oriented 
Mm. No, if you think of interacting or, or, uh, multi-particle systems, I agree with you. Usually, it's, uh, typically for fermions, it's going to be something which has to be of size, the size of the system that's going to drive the main movement, right? And, uh, okay, well, uh, let me come back to... Uh, so this was just about this finite dimensional uh, or finite volume thing. Okay, so how does one prove this? So, well actually part of the proof is uh, in spirit quite close to what Thierry just explained about the scaling theory, right? In the sense that it's not the part I'm going to discuss first because I first want to get to this part. But uh, in the sense that if to analyze a big system, right, for... So the, the first, the idea is that to analyze the infinite system, what you can try to do is analyze finite systems and let the size go to infinity, right? And you analyze finite systems in a uniform way, right? So roughly the idea is to get something, uh, to get est estimates on some quantity, which I'm going to present now, for finite system and to let the size of the finite system go to infinity, right? But you need a control that's uniform, meaning independent of the size of the finite system. So what will, be, will we analyze? One thing I forgot to say this morning is that I have a reference for, I didn't put any reference on the board, but I have a reference that I'm following, actually, by what I don't follow the whole, it's a whole book, 300 pages, and it's the book by Eisenman and Wartzel, which was published by the AMS, whoops, AMS in 2015. So they only have one book together, they have a number of papers together, but only one book. And you'll find most of the material right in there. So uh, nicely written and full proofs. Uh, okay, and so the objects that we're going to introduce is correlators. So what are correlators? Well, I'm going to stick to the notations. So fix i, some interval of the real line. So this is where we'll be looking, we'll be localizing things spectrally. So we'll lo be looking at the spectrum within this interval. And we define q of x and y. So x and y are points in the lattice of i as the supremum over all functions that are continuous in I, right, or continuous, well, actually over R, I'm going to take all functions continuous over R, that have soup norm bound, bounded by one, right, so their value, the value of the function never exceeds one. And what we look at is the following, delta X, we just look at the matrix element of some operator. So we take the spectral projector of our Hamiltonian on H, on I, right? So we just look at what's happening with energies inside I. We multiply by a function of the Hamiltonian, right? And we take this matrix element, okay? And try to understand what's happening to this object. So this is a function of two variables, X and Y, okay? And so what is this? This is just another way to write it is just a spectral projector of h omega, right? So if you, if, you think of, if you think of eigenvalues, right? If you think of eigenvalues, this is just if h omega has only eigenvalues, then this, let's say the en with eigen, uh, associated normalized eigenfunction, eigenvalues may be repeated, phi n, then one i of h omega, right, is just the sum of phi n, phi n, n for e n in i. Right, it's just a spectral projector corresponding to the eigenvalues. Of course, if it has some other spectral type, what you should do is take the spectral measure and integrate the spectral measure over i. Okay, but in the case of eigenvalues, just this. And of course, f of h omega 
is essentially the state, uh, it's the sum over all n of f of en, right? If we only have eigenvalues, it's just this. Okay. It's just a function of the operator. Okay. So in particular, imagine why does it, why is it called eigenfunction correlator? It's because in this case, if we have one and en is simple, right, they are simple eigenvalues, then you use this and this, you know that f is less than one, and what do you see? You see that q of x, y, because you take the supremum over f, is going to be equal to the sum of, uh, what did I do? I did phi n e uh, delta x, phi n, sorry, phi n, delta, there's no e, phi n delta x, phi n delta y, Right, sum over n such that en in i. Right? This is what we are looking at. So it's this correlator. Of course, this thing is well defined even if the spectrum is not made of eigenvalues. Right? Or if they're not simple. But in the case we're interested in, we only get, we only have, well, that's what it is. And the main result that, well, I won't prove the both results, but I'm going to try to prove one of them, is the following. What did I do with your razor? Well, there will be two results, actually. Uh, maybe I can, well, I can write a theorem. Um, theorem is the following. If I look at, so one, so still under the assumptions I had, right? Um, so the assumptions I had in my theorem, right, IID random variables bounded and so on, but I don't have any reference to the lambda zero. Okay, I don't need large disorder for this. I have the following. If I take the expectation value of my correlator, which is a non-negative quantity, right, this is bounded from above by some constant. So for any s, in 0, 1, there exists some constant Cs such that this is bound from above by the lim inf when L goes to infinity of the integral over R of, and now I take my operator, H omega minus, uh, sorry, not over R, over I, minus E inverse delta X delta Y to the power s de. Right, uh, sorry, I forgot something. I need to take hl, because I need a limit, I have hl, where h omega l is just a shorthand for h omega restricted to minus l, l to the d. Okay, so, So what does this say, right? What does this say? Here, I have just what is called the matrix element of the Green's function, right? I take my operator, I take the matrix element of the Green's function. But of course, every time the energy here hits an eigenvalue of this operator, I'm in trouble. The thing is going to be infinite, right? In particular, if you hit the eigenvalue here, 
when you let E come close to an eigenvalue, you know how this degenerates. This degenerates like 1 over the distance from E to the spectrum, which happens not to be integral. 1 over X does not integrate, right? This is why one puts the power S less than 1. Once you put the power S less than 1 here, it becomes integrable, right? So this is why actually the thing is called the fractional moment method. And you see, what we do here is we first analyze finite size systems. So what we are going to do, there are two different steps. The first step is going to prove this, right, such an equality. And then what we're trying to get is estimates on this. Okay, that's the second thing. Uh, did I forget something? Of course I forgot something. I forgot my expectation value on this side, right? I mean, by Fubini, I can put the expectation value outside, inside, whatever. But I forgot. Yes, sure. Well, that's the next one. It's coming. You could put the imaginary part, but you don't need it here. You see? What was the advantage of this fraction? Oh, the, ad the advantage is that you can be, because you are, you are here on a finite size system, you can be on the real axis right away. Okay? So there's one less trouble to take care of, right? You can stay on the real. This is because of the S power. But you need the S power anyway for the limit to exist. So you can also do a thing which is similar, but for directly the infinite system. And it is going to be integral over i. Uh, so it's going to be the limit when eta goes to 0 from above, integral over i, expectation. And you regularize, as was just suggested. By going to the imaginary part, right, to the major, to the upper half plane, for example, in energy. And here you have a nice operator. Okay. So the one I'm going to prove is this one. But I won't start with this. Well, the first thing I want to do is actually relate this to the estimate I had in the first theorem. Right? How do you use this, this correlator estimate, to obtain the first results? So the first thing is actually simple, or oh, relation to theorem A and B. For theorem C, you do something different. You estimate this directly, but OK. Uh, you can also, of course, one thing here, I did it over ZD, but I can do the same thing over a finite size cube, right? And I still have the same thing for the correlator. The whole thing stays true if I have the operator on a finite size cube on both sides. Or if you want, you can use this one, but then it's the same because you can go to the limit in E almost surely because if it's finite size system here, you have only eigenvalues that are well separated from one another, except that these eigenvalues, you can do the limit. Okay? So the first thing is that obviously by the definition of the correlator, if you look at the supremum over time of delta x, P, I, H, omega, E to the minus, uh, E to the I, T, H, omega, delta Y, this is, did I put the X and the Y correctly? Yep, that's the same thing. And here, of course, I'm sorry, I inverted the X and the Y. I should, doesn't really matter, right? Because it just changes this sign and here, no, it doesn't really matter. Because the thing is self-adjoint. But uh, let me put it back. Yeah, anyway. This is going to be bounded by Q, X, Y, I. And you remember, one of the things we said is that we had good estimates on this. The first theorem, theorem A, was just saying that this thing was decaying. So if we know that the correlator is decaying, right, we are fine. Why is this true? It's trivial. Because the function F over there can be any function bounded by 1, and this is a function bounded by 1. And you're taking in the correlated up there the soup of such functions. So this is certainly bounded by this soup. Right? Okay. Okay. Now, the second thing which is less obvious is that if we. How do you. So, this is just to convince you that 
if we now have some exponential, imagine that we now have this less than e to the minus some mu x minus y, right? Then we can transport this immediately to that one, right? Just this inequality. So what we're going to try to do is get exponential decay for this one. But thanks to this bound, what we'll try to do is get exponential decay for that one, right? What we're going to try to do is prove that such averages do decay exponentially independently of E. So of course, if you integrate over some compact interval in energy, you keep this exponential, this uniform exponential decay. OK? Sure, of course. Whichever, you choose. If there is any S that's more convenient than another one for you, you choose this one. Yeah, for example, you can do one half, one half, but you don't need to, actually. OK, so. Uh, it's at your convenience. Up here, yeah, no, maybe this one I want to keep up there. Up. Okay. Now, how to do spectral localization? So this is just the following thing. So theorem. So still for the same assumptions as before, assume that the sum of Take a, well, actually, let me say the following. Uh, it's uh, something slightly more general. Uh, slightly more general. Assume H, so there's no randomness here. It's going to be something independent of randomness. Assume H is uh, a self adjoint operator on L2ZD. And, uh, well, to make it simple, let's assume it's bounded. Okay? Just take a bounded self adjoint operator. For this thing, you can, of course, define pick i an open interval. Okay. And uh, uh, define q of x, y, i as above. Right? The only thing we need is a spectral calculus to do that, so it's fine. You can define it in the same way. Well, if the sum over y of q of x, y, i squared is bounded, and I want this for all x in zd, then either, uh, then the spectrum in uh, of H in I is pure point, it meaning it's only eigenvalues, right? You have only eigenvalues. And for E and an eigenvalue, right, uh, one has. Well, if I look at the projector for H, right, the spectral projector on this eigenvalue, so I don't assume that it's simple, so this thing could be a projector of rank larger than one. You look at its matrix elements, this is bounded by Q of X, I, Y. So if you have a bound on the correlator, you have a bound on this eigenprojector. If you know that the eigenvalue is simple, right, if it's simple, if E is simple, then this is nothing but phi of E x, phi of E y, right? 
if the eigenvalue is simple, which means that if you take the maximum of this one, so take a normalized eigenfunction, take the maximum to be y, you get that q of x is bounded by this for a fixed y, which is where the, this function, which is square summable, so it has to go to zero at infinity, right? And its maximal value is certainly finite because the sum of the squares is equal to one. So the maximal value is bounded by one. So you get an assumption, or you get an estimate on the decay of this one by that, okay? Okay. So, of course, we won't apply the theorem directly like this because typically what one gets is going to be something on the averages, right? But we can play the game with averaging, okay, and get something on average. Uh, okay, proof of this. The proof is based on, on a result that is called the Rage theorem. So RAGE actually is uh, an acronym that was coined, by, if I remember well, by Barry Simon for the authors of this result, which is Ruel, Amrain, Georgescu, and Enns. Right? So, and the theorem actually was proved in a different context. It was proved for uh, scattering, um, in scattering theory when people studied the stability of uh, finitely many particles in a quantum system. Right? If you look at finitely atoms with finitely many nuclei and want to know whether this is quantum stable, it's to do this that people proved, as if I remember well, the Rage theorem. So what does it say? It says roughly that if you take the projector on the continuous part of H uh, in I applied to a function phi, this is what? This is the limit Uh, when L goes to infinity of the time average of what? Of the norm of E to the I T H applied to phi squared. And here what you have to do, uh, you have to take uh, the projector on uh, what is happening. So there's something missing. There's a limit as t goes to infinity first, and the limit as goes to infinity, right? Uh, larger than L dt. Right? What's the, the significance of this physically is very simple. What do you do? You take the time average of the evolution of the operator, right? Applied to phi. Take any finite so for phi in L2, for phi in your Hilbert space. So you let it evolve under the time evolution of your operator, right? And what you are doing is you're looking only at the evolution outside some bowl. So if the state is moving off to infinity with the time evolution, the state is going to be safe because it's going to move out of the bowl because you look at the time average evolution over infinite time. Okay? And then you take a limit when this bowl is growing Right? Or if you want this neighborhood of infinity is shrinking to nothing. So the only states that you are going to miss, maybe there's a square here, uh, for the square here, there needs a square here. Uh, so the only states that you're going to miss are the eigenstates, because these are the only ones that won't move away, or linear combinations of the eigenstates. Right? Okay, and so now using this, you've expressed Using this and the estimate I had on the correlator, right? You can estimate this. You do this with delta x, delta y. You estimate this using the correlator, okay? But so you, could, you start to do it for phi being a single delta mass, okay? You use the estimate for this one using the correlator, but the correlator being square summable, you get that this limit, if you sum, you see, fix y as fix x, and sum this of a y in a large ball, or outside a large ball of size L, this is going to be going to zero, because the thing is square summable. Okay? And in this way, you prove that actually, for any delta mass, the, continuous, the projector 
on the continuous states in I of this Dirac mass is going to be zero. But of course, the Dirac mass is the basis of your Hilbert space. So if you look at all these projectors, they are going to generate the vector space of continuous states. And you just said that actually what they generate is a null vector space. It means that this vector space is zero, meaning that the only thing that's left over is pure point. And this way, you get that the spectrum has to be made only of eigenvalues. Right? You look at diffusion, you look at how the states propagate to infinity, and what you're doing here is the pro states propagating shows that this is vanishing. Okay. So you can do a, a version of this, right, which is a bit different, but actually a bit more involved. Sure, sure, of course. Sorry? What you were saying is that the states which can escape to infinity, they escape, and the other ones... And the other ones that stay fixed, they are just get projected to zero. Right? That's the only thing that's happening. Okay, so it, it's only the states that are continuous that will go off to infinity, that belong to continuous spectrum. So the next result is actually a result that essentially does the same thing, but with some additional results on the decay. So theorem, right? Uh, well, take now take h omega uh, to be a random operator, the model I had before, right? Yeah, all what I say, actually, in the book of uh, Eisenman and Watzel, they do not restrict to operators on ZD, right? What they do is actually they deal with operators on general graphs, okay? And, uh, but there is one basic feature that's crucial in all that is done in this book, which is the basic feature, which is the basic um, simplifying feature, is that for all the models they consider, just like in the Anson model, with IID coefficients, you can wiggle one of the parameters, right, of your random potential, which gives you that the operator is actually, uh, the, 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 the family of operators can be parameters by rank one perturbations of a single operator, right? They use heavily the fact that the operators as a family can be seen as rank one perturbations of one random parameters you are free to vary. Okay? It doesn't mean that the potential needs to be uncorrelated from side to side, but it means that if you fix one side and you look at the random variable at this side, uh, conditioned on all the other ones, you get a nice continuous distribution, right? which means that you can wiggle this parameter in a continuous way. This is crucial, okay? and that's the main simplifying feature. So many of these results can be repeated in a much more general setting, but of course, the way to prove them is going to depend on the setting. Okay, let this be the case, and assume we have proved the following thing. We have proved that the sum over x in Zd, uh, one, one plus x to the power let's say d plus 1, this function is not, it's, it's important, but it's not so important the precise form you take, the sum over y in zd, e to the mu x minus y, and here we have expectation value of q of x, y, i. This is finite. Let's imagine we have proved this. Of course, I hope I didn't erase this. Yes, uh, well, I did erase it. Tough luck for me. Of course, because of the previous result, we are going to prove this with this function replaced by the Green's function, right? The integral of the Green's function. 
Okay? But imagine for the moment it's already proved that you have such a decay estimate for the correlator, right? Then P almost surely. Well, the spectrum, well, this estimate certainly guarantees that omega almost surely for this integral, right, we are integrating these sums. So, of course, I could as well put the expectation value out there. The fact that this expectation value is finite means that what is inside the expectation value is finite almost surely. Otherwise, you're in trouble. Okay? And so it means that this sum, actually, without the expectation, is converging almost surely. Okay? So it means that, actually, this, because here you have an exponential factor, it means that the squares over there are also converging exponentially surely, right? Because of the exponential factor that you have here. This is enough to get square summability. It's not going to be beaten by that. Okay? So P almost surely, we have this thing above. So we know that the spectrum of H omega is pure point by what we just said, right? What we do not know, but which is true, it is simple, right? This is actually a consequence of rank one theory. It's simple. And for E an eigenvalue and uh, associated to phi E, normalized, we have phi E of x is less than, uh, than what? Than uh, C omega, which is a constant. So there exists C omega such that expectation C omega is finite. C omega, 1 plus x e to the d plus 1 over 2. Uh, e to the minus mu of x minus y. Oops, not y, but x e. Okay? I just applied the theorem above, right? What I said, y. Uh, maybe I can. Okay, I don't have a pointer. So, what I said is the following. Put the expectation outside. We know that the sum here has a finite expectation called the sum C omega. Right? So, of course, the sum is bounded by C omega. It means that the correlator is going to be bounded by C omega times the inverse of this times the inverse of that. Okay? Use the fact that the spectrum is simple and the formula which is above and take Y to be the localization center, meaning the point where phi of E has a maximum. Okay? And you're done. Okay? You get this estimate. And so this is exactly the estimate that I announced in the beginning. Five minutes, okay? I announced in the beginning for localization. Okay. Mm. Uh, five minutes. Uh, let me think. Yeah, what can I do in five? What can I skip and what can I do in five minutes? Uh, yeah, the first thing I want to do is this. So, as I said, my aim is to prove what I erased. Uh, C of S, lemma in phase L goes to plus infinity, integral of G H omega L. Uh, I think I wrote it this way. Sorry, no, uh, sorry. Delta X H omega L minus E inverse delta Y. Power, the power S is in here. DE, right? My aim is to prove this. So the first thing I'm going to prove is I'm going to look at local correlators. Uh, so, lemma. Uh, is a correlator.
for HL omega, and the first thing one has is that actually the true correlator x, y, i is bounded by the limit of the correlator q, l, y, i when l goes to plus infinity. Right, so you have this, and this is just measure theory, right? Using Lusin's theorem, so it's uh, technical work. Okay, I don't want to go more into that. Yes, please. It has an average okay. here, and this one, yeah, of course, I forgot it. Thanks. Yeah, this one has an average, definitely. True. It depends on h omega. It's not written explicitly, but you're right. Okay. The second thing is a formula relating I think this I can do. The second thing is a formula relating the correlator for finite systems to the Green's function proposition. Well, if I take Q sub L X Y, so remember this is the correlator for H omega L, which is a matrix. This is a 2L to the D by 2L to the D matrix, this thing, okay? Well, this is actually equal to the limit when S goes to 1 from, above, from below of 1 minus S over 2 integral from over I, G, X, G, sorry, it's again H omega L minus E inverse delta Y delta D, E. So here we have an equality, right? Proof. So maybe this is not, it's a small computation, right? So what you're going, here we have a matrix, right? Take its eigenvalues, there are finitely many of them, and surround the eigenvalues by a small interval. Right, so let me call these, so these are the eigenvalues, E1, En, right? And here we have small intervals, In. I'm not sure that blue was the right choice. Uh, next time I use red. Okay, and now what I'm saying is that if I look at this, so of course H omega L minus E inverse delta Y delta X, is equal to the sum 1 over E n minus E phi E uh, phi n x phi n y bar, right? Put the bar where, 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 wherever you want. And such that E n belongs to I, uh, sorry, for any, yeah. Such that for all E n actually, not over I, but for all n. Take all of them, right? And now, if I take this, I take that, what I'm saying is that if I take, so I have my interval i, which is somewhere here, right? If I integrate this i less than i n of this quantity, right, dE, this will stay bounded because you're away from the singularities, right? The limb soup s going to 1 is finite. This thing stays bounded. So when you multiply by this factor, it goes to 0. Okay, so the only thing we have to worry, this is going to be equal to the sum for n integral over i, uh, the same thing, lim when s goes to 1, 1 minus s, or 2 integral of i of the same blah, 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 power S, D, E, right? But of course, inside the sum, in I n, the only thing that doesn't stay bounded is the term with the exact E n for this given n, right? So here this is I n, sorry. So this is the sum over n, lim S goes to 1 of minus S over 2 integral 
obviously, over i n of 1 divided by uh, blah blah blah, what did I have? E n minus e to the power s. And here I have phi n x s phi n y s. Right? Now s goes to 1. So here I have the de. This you can compute. Right? This you compute the integral. And you see that this thing goes to 1. This is a finite number. s goes to 1. This goes to phi n x, phi n y. And this is q. And that's it. OK, and I stop here. Thanks very much for your attention. Yes, you can do that. Yeah, you can always make that choice. Uh, you had some quick arguments to let us understand those two ends. Uh huh. And I didn't use this. Ah, I sure. I can go over that again. Yeah, no problem. Hope I didn't erase it. Here it is. Okay. <laughs> So the, the proper proof, right, is based on a famous lemma by Wiener, which says that if you take the Fourier transform of a measure, right, take its modulus square and take the time average, this goes to the sum of the Dirac masses of this measure squared, right? And, but the idea, the physical idea is the following. What's happening? If you take a continuous state, right, because you take the time average limit first, right, what you're going to recover is that the whole state is going to travel outside of this box. It's going to travel to infinity. This is the, the, the content. Uh, actually, this is the complementary. If you take eigenvalues, this is the content of what's happening to the Wiener measure, of what's the, the proof of the Wiener measure, right? But this is the physical argument, is that because it's continuous spectrum, this thing is going to travel, right? And because the box here, you're outside a finite box, all the mass of this vector is going to travel outside of this box because you take the t limit first, okay? And so if you take now eigenfunctions, right? Of course, they will decay at infinity and the thing is not going to travel. It's just going to oscillate with an oscillation rate, which is the eigenvalue, okay? And so it will stay inside the box. If you take the limit now, the box, you know, it's going to be projected to zero, right? So this is the content of Rage theorem. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the only thing I'm saying is this. This average is an integral, right? So the whole thing here is linear. I can take the expectation here. It's the same thing. I'm saying that this expectation is finite, but in particular, this means that this positive quantity has to be finite almost surely. Otherwise, if you take the expectation, you get plus infinity, okay? So we know that this thing, I let me call it C of omega, is finite every, almost everywhere, right? And then just apply the previous result, right? So you mean if you have this sum to be less than C of omega, an individual term like this is certainly going to be less than C omega as well. We are summing positive terms, right? And you're done. Okay, so it's, it's really brute force, right? It's starting. Yes. Is the statement with the P's just a consequence of this plus some sort of clever, like... The, w w with the P's, what you mean? Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's, it, it, well, <laughs> you see, what's happening is it, it is a consequence of essentially the same thing, but not, I mean, yeah, it is essentially a consequence of this, except that if you deal with finite system, right, there is no uh, self-averaging going on. So events 
the fact to have bad events will happen with a positive probability. There's no way to get rid of them altogether, right? And this is, so it's the same kind of estimate, but taking into account this, the, the fact that you have these, these probabilities that are non-vanishing. They're small, but not vanishing. But it's the same estimate, yeah. No, 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 not the exponential decay. Just the fact that you have pure point spectrum. If, you, if it's just convergent... No, no, I know, but I mean, technically, what you're actually proving in all possible examples is uh, the exponential decay. Yes. The exponential bound on Q. Well, yeah. Technically, what you actually need... is just the square summability, yeah. The other examples between the two other... Okay, examples. other examples where you know how to prove square summability... So, there are two things. There are examples where you know how to prove square summability, right? But it doesn't mean that exponential decay is not correct. It's just you only know how to prove square summability. Are there examples where you know that exponential decay is not correct? No, I don't know of any examples where I know that exponential, uh, exponential decay is not correct. I know of examples where I can only prove something weaker, which is still enough for localization, right? But uh, not where exponential decay is not correct. Actually, uh, maybe one, just one word uh, to comment on this. Exponential decay, where does it, it, com where does it come from? Right? Where does this exponential decay come from? It comes from the fact that if you look at the symbol of the Laplacian, right, it's analytic. Right? And this is where exponential... So if you take any operator with an analytic symbol, right, so you, take the, you assume that the dispersion relation in physical terms is analytic, you are going to get exponential decay. Right? This, is, this is the root of it. So if you, as soon as you imagine that you replace the Laplacian by some matrix, which is still a convolution, but for which the dispersion or the symbol is not analytic anymore, things start changing. Right? But you still can have localizations. So it means that you can have long-range hopping. You need long-range, otherwise uh, short-range hopping is going to be analytic because it's a Fourier symbol. So you but just proved that that's what the Okay, thanks very much for your attention. My pleasure. <laughs>